Okay, um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming back after lunch. Um, so our afternoon session will change a little bit uh, in subject. So in the morning it was more technical in nature, so now in the afternoon we are switching more to public policy and ethics and uh, social impact. <clears throat> and uh, in the other session afterwards more on, you know, the corporate side of things, spin-off companies and the like. And I hope also you all enjoyed the student presentations outside, right? All of this would be nothing without the students, right? That's our core business. Yay for students! <laughs> right? So, uh, I mean, I, I encourage all of you to really visit the displays outside, right? These are students in the data science program from all these 14 different departments working together, solving problems, making the world a better place. Um, and so please uh, support them and check out what they're doing and visit them, right? That's very important. And offer them jobs. Sorry? And offer them. They don't have problems finding a job. That's not really <laughs> even so hard. We get a lot of requests. So with that, um, Talking about making the world a better place, we are switching to our session on AI for public good, and um, I'm, I'm really pleased to uh, hand over to Tracy Lorio in our School of Journalism and Communication, who's going to chair the session. Thanks, Great. Tracy. Thank you. Did you have a good lunch? Yeah. That was a good lunch, huh? Thank you, sponsors, for the good lunch. <laughs> Thank you, Institute for Data Science, for the good lunch. Thank you, John, for getting us to the good lunch. <laughs> yeah, he's, yeah, John is washing the dishes, unfortunately. Look, I'm really happy that you made it here after lunch, and we got you right after lunch, so the carbs haven't really sunk in yet. Uh, so you're not going to start dozing off, but the panel is far too interesting for you to start dozing off. So without further ado, what I'd like to do is introduce to you the panelists for the AI for Public Good uh, panel and discussion this afternoon. I have the good fortune of essentially putting together a group of panelists of people that I really like. And not only do I really like them, they do really interesting work and they have really interesting backgrounds. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through who they are a little bit. They're each going to come out one by one and talk to you about the kind of work that they're doing and why they do this work and how it ties in with the public good. And afterwards, we're going to have a question and answer session. Uh, they can ask questions to you. You can ask questions to them. You'll see some microphones here on the side. I can ask them some questions, and I can ask you some questions. So essentially, we all have to be alert for this because we're all going to be part of this question and answer series. So without further ado, let me start off. I'd like to introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Sandra Robertson from Communication and Media Studies and the School of Journalism and Communication here at Carleton University. Uh, Dr. Robinson studies the role of algorithms in contemporary media culture. This work engages with critical concerns around software design, AI, big data, privacy, surveillance, and power. So all the big stuff, all the important stuff, all the critical stuff we need to be thinking about when we think about a lot of these new onboarding technologies that relate to data. Dr. Robinson uh, is, holds a PhD in sociology, an MA in legal studies, and an MBA in Digital Technology Management, and an BA in Anthropology. So quite frankly, I think she's the most interesting person in the room, unless you can outdo her in terms of the unique combination of degrees that she has. But also what's very interesting is Dr. Robinson, between all of these degrees and all the studies and all of the research that she does, she did some really weird jobs in her life. Many of us have, and we most likely will continue to. But she also worked in the software industry. So she brings a unique critical perspective, theoretical perspective, and as you can see, a unique educational perspective. Our second panelist at the very, very end over here is Dr. Wolfgang Alschner, who's an empirical legal scholar with a specialization in international economics and law and the computational analysis of law, which is, as I understand, a new and emerging field. And we're going to hear a little bit about what that looks like and what that means. So that's great for us. He crossed the pond 
uh, over to Ottawa from Germany not too long ago. But right now he is based in the common law section at the University of Ottawa, where he teaches data science and programming to law students and conducts research in the field of legal data science. So we have data science and now we have legal data science. So we're going to hear a little bit about what that looks like and what that means. In his work, he uses natural language processing, network analysis, and machine learning to mine large amounts of legal data in order to solve legal policy problems, of which we have many, I'm sorry to say, so you'll be busy for the next 30, 40, 50 years, and to support evidence-based policy making at the national and international level. Thirdly, right beside Sandra here, we have Dr. Matthew Till, and he's a senior data scientist with Employment and Social Development Canada, and has been with the department since 2009. So it's very nice to see someone stay in the same place for a while at the federal government, which means we have some embedded expertise, which is fabulous. Mm -hmm. But wait till you see what Matthew does. Matthew is responsible for leading ESDC's artificial intelligence strategy, which outlines how the department will responsibly and ethically use artificial intelligence to deliver value for the taxpayer. That's us, so that's great. Thank you for doing that on our behalf. He also leads several artificial intelligence initiatives at ESDC in the areas of natural language processing and strategic optimization. He likes all, he like, of course he likes all the other panelists, but he, like all the other panelists, has an interesting background. He has a PhD in statistics and actuarial science from the University of Waterloo, where he focused on Venetian statistics and computer simulation of complex systems. So basically, this is a very serious panel doing policy, politics, and governance, but also come with the requisite technological backgrounds as well to back up what they say and what they do. And last but not least, right here, we have our fourth panelist, and that is Niraj Bhargava. He's founder and CEO of New Energy AI. He calls himself a serial entrepreneur, which is great because we need business people to pay taxes and we need people to pay attention <laughs> to the taxes that they pay. So we're all in a good place. And he has a passion, and it, he hires people like students, which is also good. He has a passion for innovation that benefits society. New Energy AI partners with innovators, industry, technical experts, and government to navigate the challenge of delivering principled and trustworthy artificial intelligence with their machine trust index. And he's going to walk us through what that looks like in a little while, which measures the trustworthiness of artificial intelligence applications and solutions. He's also the chair of the Innovation Committee of the Board at the Royal Ottawa. So thank you for doing that work. We need people to do this kind of very important technological volunteering type of work. He holds a Bachelor of Science in System Design and Engineering from University of Waterloo. We will not hold that against you. Uh, <laughs> and an MBA from Ivy Business School with an International Business Certificate from the Stockholm School of Economics. So it's going to run, the panel's going to run as follows. They're each going to share their unique views on artificial intelligence and the public good. We'll then open the floor and have a conversation till about 3.15. Uh, you have microphones on either side for your questions. And are you okay with that? Is that going to, does that look like a good plan for the next hour and a bit? Yes? All right. So without further ado, my colleague Sandra Robinson. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, to this. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, I was going to fly by the seat of my pants today, but then I taught this morning, and then I thought, no, I better write something down. So don't be. It's, it's very. It's just a few very brief comments. Um, just kind of, uh, in a way, what I'm going to do is situate some of the concerns I have. Um, and because I think when we think about AI for public good, uh, we also want to know that it's situated within some thoughtful uh, ideas around uh, ethical considerations and what sort of works best for its application in, in society. So uh, what I'm going to talk about, uh, uh, some in varying detail briefly, is privacy, both informational privacy and decisional privacy, though I won't, I won't go too much into that, but just in case anybody wants to talk more in the discussion period. Algorithms and um, AI governance, accountability. We're always worrying, I think, about transparency, but I often fret about 
how we trace and establish accountability. Um, and also the ethical framework required, I think, for designing, evaluating, and monitoring AI platforms. And um, then unantici unanticipated consequences that can arise. And uh, really, it, it all fits together really nicely with my, um, my fellow panelists in terms you'll see uh, some of the things that I'll speak to or have gestured towards that they'll pick up on. It's uh, very fortuitous. So thank you for that interconnection in the planning, Tracy. <laughs> Um, so uh, I do want to touch on discrimination. This is one of the sort of preeminent uh, concerns and sometimes unfortunate characteristics uh, of, of AI systems. And there are important concerns about discrimination in decision support systems that arise, um, in my view, through the establishment of new labels, variables, and classes that de define terms and categories in complex AI systems and can easily embed particular kinds of assumptions and bias that, engine, uh, that des designers and developers hold and that influence the selection of features and functions in a system. So that's one thing to think about. Where we've seen that recently is the, of course, the Amazon hiring uh, debacle of last year where it trained its artificial intelligence system using records of past applicants to the company who had been hired and who were overwhelmingly men. And this training data set up the program to discriminate against applications from women. And since the program had access to large data repositories of past applicants, um, it was able to infer gender uh, from factors in the applications, such as whether it's, you know, applicants had attended an all-woman college. And the AI system filtered out female candidates, um, just as Amazon had always done, actually. So it reproduced that kind of bias, even though it was a new system. Excuse me. Um, smart systems um, can find correlations in data as well, and this can also be a risk that should, uh, correlations in the data that should not serve as a new category in and of themselves. And I think this is actually hard sometimes for system designers and developers to resist. But this is the case where, for example, you find links between uh, geographic area, poverty, and ethnicity and race, and then using that as a means to segment particular populations or correlations between data sets that over time reveal patterns that data subjects don't want revealed. Um, so such as sexual orientation, sexual identity, or, or health issues. Um, for example, uh, Facebook's a great example of this. Uh, my colleague Rena Bivens has done work in this area. Facebook can um, take behavioral data in terms of their ad targeting system and use labels and their own sort of smart analysis platform and create new categories that they term as sensitive uh, interests into which um, they place terms and designations that include words and phrases such as Islam or reproductive health or homosexuality. And these designations can be the subject of discrimination when Facebook sells access to this data to advertisers when it's been you know, segmented in particular ways. So these current concerns also do figure in decisional privacy, well, the kinds of data used to make decisions about people or that impact um, people as citizens, consumers, health subjects, job applicants, and so on. And I think these are some of the concerns also reflected in, in some of the systems that both corporations and governments are, are thinking about. And uh, the other thing I want, um, just sort of four things to sort of end up on, excuse me, I was getting over a cold. Um, but the AI sector, in my view, um, and I know that that's a very broad uh, sector with a lot of different disciplines reflected in it, um, they need to pay, in my view, close attention from an engagement with um, researchers. So um, people uh, like me and others, and, and uh, in fact, Tracy, who sit outside computer science and data science, but engage with those disciplines and ideas. And those include people from, uh, or who identify as sociologists, geographers, philosophers, health science researchers, legal and socio-legal uh, scholars, communication and media studies scholars, uh, policymakers, stakeholders, and of course, good old-fashioned people, um, uh, consumers and citizens. And publics really need clear and concise explanations that don't play on fears about the unknown. Um, and um, more than ever, we need to present facts over futuristic scenarios. Secondly, I would just think about ethical frameworks that need to be used from the conception of an idea to the completion of AI, AI systems, not simply audited um, later on for compliance, but through the whole process, much like privacy for design. And we also need to ensure that we're able to explain and interpret what the systems do and how they do it. That's really crucial to building an understanding, not just in specialized fields, but more broadly in society. And then uh, ethical governance. 
to be able um, to have a consistent framework under which these complex systems are governed. And this cannot simply be, in my view, through corporate self-regulation, but be attached to ethical principles and standards that ensure that data subjects as citizens and consumers are considered in humane and dignified ways by the non-human decision support systems through which we delegate particular kinds of tasks. So these are just some of the concerns that I think of that I could wax on for you know days. Um, but uh, I think maybe it does foreground some of the other comments and uh, specific things that my colleagues will get into. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Wolfgang Arschner, and first of all, I would like to thank Tracy and the organizers for inviting me. This is the first time that I'm here in Carlton. I'm ashamed to say, but hopefully it won't be the, the last time. So um, today I should start by explaining why I'm here, because it's really not intuitive why a law professor would be invited to a data day. And uh, I'm really sort of, of um, an odd animal, because while we have lawyers who think about the societal implications of of data and artificial intelligence on the law, what I'm doing is something even a little bit more exotic, and that is the data science of the law. And I'll hope to explain what, what I mean by that. And that's so exotic because uh, if you were to ask some of my students, one of the reasons why they chose to study law is precisely because they don't like numbers. And data science is very much about numbers, as you know. So to put these two things together is something that's a little bit uh, perhaps counterintuitive. But at the same time, uh, one of the reasons why these two actually merge more and more is that in the past when we talked about data, and especially when lawyers talked about data, we always had this economist or perhaps nerdy computer scientist in the back of our minds who was working on spreadsheets. But this type of structured data sets is really not what we are talking about today when we talk about data science. Because the real value that is today generated by data science comes from unstructured data and unstructured data is actually all around us it is videos that are that are taken it is the audio that is recorded but it's also the texts that uh, are around us and of course text is the medium that we as lawyers work with all the time we interpret statutes we read cases and uh, we uh, analyze regulations and that's then where the link between data science and law comes in because law is data legal text is data. And so once we then start thinking about law as data, we can start to mine legal texts. And that is, again, something that is very foreign to us uh, with a legal training, because what do we do normally with text? As I said, we engage in a close reading of, of a document. We try to interpret. We are trying to, to reveal this hidden meaning. And of course, that's really not something that a, that a computer can do in the same way a computer cannot read between the lines. But what a computer can do is to analyze large amounts of text in very efficient ways and to reveal patterns that we might not be able to detect by uh, reading these texts as a, as a human. And so what emerges here is a complementarity between these traditional skills that lawyers have always done, this detailed reading of text, this interpretation, but it is now supplemented and complemented by this idea of a legal data science where we are trying to use artificial intelligence and data science tools in order to mine large amounts of legal texts to then reveal insights and to prompt lawyers to think about questions in a different light. And so with this uh, little introduction, let's uh, then pass to the question of, okay, Lawyers are doing things a little bit differently now, but why is that related to uh, AI for good? I think there are three reasons why it's related. Uh, first of all, lawyers are really expensive. And that's a bit of a problem because a lot of people want access to lawyers. They need uh, legal services. They want access to justice. But they cannot get it because lawyers are expensive. And so by disintermediating law, by making legal services available without this lawyer that has to translate what the law means, we can solve part of that access to justice problem that is plaguing not only this country, but is pla uh, plaguing uh, countries around the world, including also on the international level. So first of all, by disintermediating 
law, by sort of taking the lawyer out of the picture, we can improve access to justice. And we can talk a little bit more in the discussion how that can be done. Second, and that relates a little bit to my own profession for lawyers, uh, I've just said disintermediating lawyers. That sounds very scary to a lot of lawyers, of course. They don't want to be replaced by a, by a machine. But at the same time, when we think about this, even for lawyers, AI is for good. Because what we like to do as lawyers is to to plead in front of a court, to make creative arguments. We don't like to sit in a room and go through thousands of contracts to see which clause uh, might be relevant for this particular case, or to go through millions of emails to see whether there's any kind of liability in them. So there are things that we as lawyers have often done, because we had to, but now data science can make that part of the work redundant so that we as lawyers can focus on the things that we actually want to do, and that is to advance uh, uh, social values and to, to make creative arguments. The third point why AI is uh, related to good in terms of legal data science is governance. There is no other player in this world who has more legal data that needs to be mined than the government. They sit on thousands of regulations, they sit on uh, thousands of laws, they litigate uh, in the courts, they make policy recommendations, and that is a rich amount of data. But, the government doesn't always have the capacity to analyze these data because, like um, normal citizens, lawyers are expensive also for the government. So we have to think how we can mine this data and leverage the insights that can be generated uh, for that for governance. And to give you one concrete example, over the uh, la over last summer, uh, together with a couple of students and former legal drafting experts, we've looked at 3,000 Canadian regulations over time. Because the government is always trying to make regulations better. You've all heard of the red tape that's being generated by regulations that creates business costs. So there's a constant effort to reform the regulatory stock in Canada. But in the past, the government has really sort of uh, gone about it in, in the wrong way, if you ask me. Uh, they put in place rules such as for every new regulation, that uh, you want to put in place, you have to get rid of an old regulation, so to keep red tape constant. But what you actually want to do is you want to get rid of bad regulation, and you want to uh, put in place good regulation. But then the question arises, how can you tell good regulation from bad regulation? And data science, as we've shown in, as part of that um, project for the Cana uh, Canada School of Public Service, can actually help us to identify characteristics in regulations using natural language processing that uh, address the prescriptivity of these regulations, the flexibility that's uh, embedded in them, the complexity and also the outdatedness. And so these types of information can then be used in order to identify targets for reform. I want to close then with a, a last observation that is, in order to really make this work, we cannot just work as lawyers with computer science and computer scientists cannot just work with lawyers. What we are really trying to do here is to, in essence, uh, create a new breed of uh, lawyers who know about data science but who are also knowledgeable about the law. And that's why, uh, amongst others, at the University of Ottawa, we have this new course, Data Science for Lawyers, where I teach programming to lawyers, which again is sort of odd when you think about it, but it actually does make a lot of sense. And hopefully throughout the discussion, we can explore some of the uh, insights that arise from that in more detail. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for having me. As Tracy mentioned, my name is Matthew Till. I am with Employment and Social Development Canada. Um, ESDC doesn't make it into the news too often, and if it does, it's probably for not so good reasons. Um, so just a little bit about what ESDC does first. Um, we are effectively the labor market, um, income security, and primary service delivery arm of the federal government. Um, so our major statutory programs that we both develop policy for and deliver as services are Canada Pension Plan, Old Age Security, and employment insurance, I'm sure everybody's heard of all of those, uh, but we have over 100 different programs when you move into different labor market opportunity programs. We have uh, programming for students, programming for persons with disabilities. Um, so really the, the mandate at one point said from, from cradle to grave, I think. Um, and so really SDC touches Canadians' lives uh, all, all throughout. Um, I work for the Chief Data Office at the at ESDC. Uh, the Chief Data Office was formed about almost three years ago now, I suppose. Uh, the first such Chief Data Office at the Government of Canada. Um, 
I work for the Data Science Division, where uh, we have been uh, pushing the department forward on a number of different, call them artificial intelligence projects, so a lot of data science, a lot of deep learning, a lot of natural language processing. I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, where uh, we're really trying to improve the way we both deliver the services that I just spoke about, but also develop the policy of all the, um, associated with those services as well. Um, so as we were going through a number of these different pilots, um, we realized that um, there's not, there's a lot of discussion, I guess, around this concept, really, AI, AI for public good. Um, what is responsible artificial intelligence? What, what does that mean? Um, but something that really I think was, I almost want to say has been, it, it's been, it's been getting better lately, but it was really almost cobbled together as sort of like a little, a lot of ad hoc discussions from different areas. Um, and there's really no rule book in any of this stuff anyway. So the, the notion was, well, as we go to mature as an organization, we need to put together an artificial intelligence strategy, um, which will outline, you know, what we think AI governance in, in our area should look like, but also how we go about developing AI policy. What does all this stuff mean? How do we, um, how do we make sure that the decisions that we're making are aligned with what, you know, taxpayer interests? Um, how do we make sure they're aligned with, with it, what everyone else is doing? And what a, a lot of these discussions are subjective to the point of political, right? So we're not even, as public servants, I'm not even at liberty to make decisions about these things. These things need to go to the government. These things need to go to the taxpayer to be able to answer some of these questions. Um, and it might be an interesting place for this conversation to go if we, if we end up going there. Um, so uh, the strategy outlines, um, I would say, the overall goal of the strategy really is to just start the conversation, right? We want to make sure that people have the information they need to bring their expertise to the table and help with the course of voices to make informed decisions. So that's very high level. I'm not sure how helpful that is. So I'll, I'll go into a bit more detail um, now. So there are mainly, when, when you, to start the conversation, I would say, and to make sure that we're setting on the right track, there are three main elements to what, to what we think will, will be ESCC's contribution to, to AI public good. Um, and the first is, and at risk of preaching to the choir, the first is education. Um, and I think the, all those posters that were out there in the back are evidence that the education system is actually quite working and that a lot of people are gaining access to this knowledge, to the tools, to the algorithms, how they work, um, what they mean, what they imply in a way that I don't think I've ever seen before, right? Like this, this area is remarkably open in terms of open source code that's out on the internet, algorithms that are made mathematically available to people, the, the opportunity to learn everything you need to about AI to make informed decisions about it are, is there. Um, and I think the evidence of, of the intersection of AI algorithms and law is a perfect example, right? I don't know that this would have happened in the past without the ability of that information to get out there and to be able to leverage it, um, which is really, really, really cool. Um, it means that when different players, and I'll get to that in a second, come to the table, they can come to the table in an informed view of, okay, what is a, when we're talking about reinforcement learning algorithms, what are we talking about, right? When we're talking about generative algorithms and deep fakes, what are we talking about? How do these things work? Um, and when, when the chorus of voices can have that information, it's a much more informed decision. Um, and I think that itself entails greater, greater public good in terms of the use of artificial intelligence. Um, second, so um, this one is a little bit, uh, this one probably shows up in the news more. And, and second, area is, is effectively responsible use. Um, and so we talk about ethical AI um, as a sort of a broad level. Um, you can break it down into many different dimensions of, well, what is ethical AI? You know, ethical AI is compliant with the law and with, with privacy law and, and policy. Um, ethical AI strives to, as Sandra mentioned, reduce bias um, and different forms. A ethical AI is transparent. Ethical AI is um, there's a solid communication strategy and notification about when AI is affecting people's lives, um, and so I think there's a lot of work um, that's that's undergoing. I think Europe is probably the most advanced, and a lot of their stuff is is, is um, a lot of their stuff is, is making its way around the globe. I would say, and really sort of starting to at least set the you know set the precedent for what the conversation should be about today. Um, but as I mentioned before, this is a lot of these move into political issues. A lot of these move into issues where my job as a public servant isn't necessarily laid down the law, but my job as a public servant is just make sure that the make sure that the taxpayer and the government rep government representing the taxpayer has flexibility to go the direction it wants um, when it's ready to make decisions on these things. Because we haven't made decisions on these things. It's it's very much. Um, 
it's very much a, an open discourse right now, and, and forums like this um, are fantastic in terms of keeping that conversation going. So those first two, um, those first two, I would say, uh, the, the, the AI community has focused a lot on, and it, it's been very successful to date, and we have a long way to go, uh, but we're getting there. Um, the third is a little bit um, not too common to hear from a public servant, but the third area that I think, um, the third area where um, government and, and similar organizations need to push um, in order to ensure AI for public good is the idea of value. And by value, I mean business acumen um, in many ways, right? And so here the idea is um, we as a government, we as you as taxpayers, me as a taxpayer, we invest a lot of money into this area. We invest a lot of money in terms of research grants, um, a lot of government contracts that go out. Like there's a, there's a number of different ways that the government is supporting the development of artificial intelligence, and it's fantastic. And and you know, it happens in the um, happens as high as the budget level. The the Pan Canadian AI strategy was referenced this morning. Um, but one of the questions that we need to answer is how are we going to measure the value that the citizen is getting back for all these investments? I, as a taxpayer, want to know that question, right? How do we, it's, and it, there are different models throughout the globe. Um, and, and again, a lot of these go into political discussions, and, and you know, we can head there if we want. I'm sort of limited in, in, in the opinions I can give. Um, but one of the ways this has really started to manifest itself that I think needs public attention is this idea of data proprietorship. I don't know if uh, Tracy wanted to go there today, but anyway. Um, <laughs> um, in the past, governments, and, and my, my department, just as, just as much as anyone, governments have been guilty of treating data as a byproduct, right, of a service that we're trying to provide, something that, well, is something that we need to take care of because we need to, but we didn't sort of recognize the value that it provides, and I think this is true of certain areas in the health sector. Um, there was an article in the Toronto Star a couple months back about the, the electronic medical records associated with Ontario doctors, where I think it's, it's worth investigating. Um, but basically, there are, and I noticed yesterday your, your post on LinkedIn about data brokerages is another uh, interesting aspect. <laughs> um, but if, if the public is going to invest in these things and provide public services, we should have a very strong business acumen about the data that's associated with these services providing and what is the value of the data that we're getting back. Um, and so that is a key conversation that probably doesn't happen enough. It started to happen more and more. Usually when it happens, it's a wait a minute, you know, kind of thing, after we sort of realize some of the activities that were going on. Uh, but there, are, there is a need, um, as we move forward, I think, as, as society and as, as the public, to have, say, the government, um, you know, who is the voice of the taxpayer, and, and public, service, public servants to provide the flexibility there to ensure that options are open when it comes to the value we derive from the investments in AI, the value we derive from the investments in data um, to make sure that it's being realized. So I will leave it there, but happy to chat further. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks uh, very much, uh, Tracy and John, uh, for inviting me to speak uh, uh, with these esteemed colleagues here on, on the panel uh, on the topic of AI for public good. Uh, I'm, uh, I was wondering, while I'm last on the panel, but I think I'm actually because I'm bridged between perhaps this topic of public good, but also the startups that are going to be talked, uh, talking at the next uh, panel. Uh, because I, uh, I am a serial entrepreneur. I've been involved in technology for a long time. I'm uh, pleased to also be affiliated here at Carleton on the advisory board at Sprott and being part of the sustainable energy uh, research that has, has happened here. But this topic uh, has been part of my career all, all along is this topic of technology for good. And I think uh, I, I, when I asked myself the question, was it technology for bad? I, I don't think there is necessarily, but, but there's a lot of us that are quite passionate about using uh, technology in, uh, to benefit society and make, uh, make the world a better place. And I, I'm pleased to see the, uh, the uh, students and entrepreneurs around uh, the room on, on that topic. Um, I am going to use a few PowerPoints, and I hope that's okay uh, uh, here. But uh, when we talk about AI for public good, and uh, we've been talking about technology and advancements for a long time. So what's different about AI? So AI is certainly a, a, a big uh, trend and, and, and very important area. Uh, but I think we all know that uh, there is some differences between what's going on in machine learning and AI uh, from technology trends of the past. And, uh, and I think it's, it's, uh, uh, we're at the early stages of what's going on in, in artificial intelligence. And uh, this uh, Friedman uh, picture that maybe some of you have seen I, I put up that illustrates that there's something 
different happening with AI, and that is the fact that with the advancements in algorithms and memory and processing power uh, and all the great research that's going on, is that we actually now have technology that's adapting faster than people. And we have technology that's actually learning faster than people. So while there's a tremendous opportunity for good, and I'll, I'll mention you know, in my background, uh, climate change and sustainable energy has been something that we've been looking at predictive data and analytics for a long time. But we now have an opportunity to apply AI and machine learning to these big global problems and challenges. But we do also have to be sensitive to the fact that this is the, has the ability to be self-learning and adapt on its own by, by learning a lot from the data and, and creating uh, this uh, ability to, to self-learn. And that creates something that's a little bit different, I would say, in AI. And that is, and it came up a number of times, and certainly in this discussion, is the need for trust. Because we've been dealing with this topic of trust forever. And I'm really pleased to see when we talk about data science and, and these, this data day, we're talking about multidisciplinary topics here. Because it isn't just a computer science topic. It is multidisciplinary. And when the topic of trust is one that's been around forever. And when we talk about human trust, you know, we're still working on it, even though we've been dealing with it for centuries, millennia. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have the legal system to protect us on issues of human trust. We have uh, reference checking. We have auditors. Lots of topics on, on the topic of human trust. But if we now have algorithms and data analysis and AI that's learning on its own, what about trust of machines and AI? So I think we see and we already are seeing a number of instances that if we want to apply AI for, for public good, we do need to make sure that we can trust it. And so what I'm uh, pleased to be sharing here as a, as a serial entrepreneur and one in the AI world is that we are looking at AI trust as a topic that needs uh, significant attention. So we're seeing that there's a need to not only develop uh, great machine learning and AI applications for public good and, and for the advancement of society, but also we need to measure and manage it effectively. Because if you're going to apply it for good, you better be able to trust it uh, and be able to sustain it. So with that backdrop, I, I'm pleased to share that our company, New Energy AI, uh, has, uh, has developed an innovation that we call the Machine Trust Index. We actually are su suggesting that there should be an ecosystem of, of companies that are not only developing AI, but are also helping to manage and measure AI. So what we have done, and we're an early stage company that's just uh, uh, commercializing our, our technology and methodologies now, is that we're saying let's break it down into parts and figure out how do we trust or not trust our AI activities. And uh, we've broken it into a number of dimensions, perhaps obvious ones, and ones that have come up already from my colleagues, but the topic of bias, privacy, transparency, ethics. These are all very important areas and we believe that we can start not just talking about it, but actually measuring it and managing it so that we can look at our AI developments, our deployments, and our deployments over time and assess and watch and manage uh, how uh, our AI is active. Because we do want to get that societal good and the, the public good opportunity out of what we're doing in machine learning and AI, but we also want to make sure that we don't have these unintended consequences and risks that I know uh, we're also concerned about. So this innovation is, is really the idea of creating measures and, ma and ways to manage uh, AI. And, um, and we're pleased to be, be sharing that. I'm happy to answer questions on our, on our machine trust index. But there's a couple of things I'd like to just share about the concept, because really, I, I'd like to uh, call out to others uh, in the room, uh, researchers, entrepreneurs, innovators, to look at the topic of trust more holistically as, as a broader ecosystem. The uh, example, well, let me, let me start first of all on, on this uh, likening machine trust to human trust. And uh, we recognize that when we talk about trust of humans and other people, you know, it's not a one size fits all. Who I trust and who you trust may have differences. And it may also be uh, something that evolves over time. I may trust you today, but over time I, that trust may grow or not grow. Similarly with machines, we believe that uh, when you measure trust, uh, of an algorithm or an AI, it's not going to be uh, one size fits all. What you trust and what I trust and what ESDG trusts or, or a hospital trusts may not be the same. 
we need to understand from the perspective of the user of the AI, what is trust and how do we measure it? And it needs to evolve over time as well. So what we have done is created a, a framework that essentially we co-create the, the, the trust index and use the best possible trust tools to apply and measure the trust elements that, uh, that have been uh, identified. Let me, let me use one, uh, one use case as an example. Uh, I, uh, I've come from the energy industry where we, we use uh, uh, predictive analytics in, in whether we need a power plant or not. Certainly in health, I am, I'm pleased to be on the board of the Royal Ottawa and mental health is an area where there's lots of opportunity for, for AI and machine learning to, to, uh, to uh, have some uh, opportunities. But uh, the simple example I'll use is actually uh, one that we have probably most of us have experience with is voice recognition. And uh, back 30 years ago when I worked in BNR uh, many years ago, we've been talking about using voice, uh, voice recognition for a long time. And the idea of what's the ideal user interface to your technology has been a, a challenge for, the, for a long time. And so now we're at touch screens and, and devices, but the idea that you can talk to your technology is wonderful. We have a lot of other purposes with our hands. So now, suddenly in the last few years, we're at a point where neural nets and machine learning and deep learning has allowed us to actually be understood by our technology. So I'm sure many of you have used Siri or Google or Alexa. And uh, I was pleased to be part of a startup in Montreal called Fluent AI that actually was doing voice recognition as well, but wasn't sending the data to the cloud and was having it trained and learned based on the individual. And the uh, measurement I'll, I'll share is that when we talk about voice recognition and the value of uh, Alexa understanding what music you want to hear, that's great. But that's if you speak American English. Maybe if you speak German. But if you have a heavy accent or a speech impediment, you may not be well understood. So there's a, a bias in, those, in that technology. And the other issue is one of privacy. And it was mentioned about GDPR, I'll, I'll wrap up here that when GDPR came out, Google sent out a note to everybody saying, don't worry, my data is your data. Click here and you can find out what data is being recorded. The conversations with my daughters is being recorded by Hey Google, and I wasn't very comfortable with that. So there's risks in, in the AI and the training that sometimes are, are not uh, well known, and so we'd like to illuminate that. So that's my introduction to this topic of AI for public good and measuring trust. I look forward to the discussion. So well, there we go. We have a very uh, interesting group of panelists. And to summarize before we open it up, we have uh, a scholar that's looking at artificial intelligence studies. And she's talked to us about transdisciplinary research in this environment to look at the full life cycle of AI when we're considering issues of public good and ethics and practices, as well as the ethical governance of AI. We have another scholar that's talking to us about one that I was surprised because normally when we talk about AI and labor, it's not getting rid of lawyers. So that's the first time that's usually it's another kind of labor. It's, it's usually manual labor or labor in industry that we consider, but we don't often think about this kind of labor. But in concurrently, it's also improving the work of lawyers using AI. So that's very interesting. As well as um, considering of making government better by detecting bad uh, governance and bad regulation and hopefully being able to offer opportunities to create good uh, regulation and good legislation. We also have a perspective, uh, so that's two scholars providing us perspectives from communication and media studies and uh, law and legal studies and law and data science. And then we have from government uh, the idea that if we're going to have an AI strategy, education is incredibly important, responsible use is important, the value proposition is open, and then we can't do a lot of that uh, value work unless the information is open and that we can build on it and work on it. And if I've missed anything, you guys let me know because I'm summarizing pretty quick. And then finally, from our private sector colleague, Naraj, he's talking about creating a tool that can hopefully help us trust AI AI a little bit more with his, the machine trust index and he suggests that the way one way to go about it is to have a holistic perspective and an understanding on trust so that I kind of can I capture everything all right so now it's your turn because we've talked for a while 
and you've just had lunch and I don't want you to go to sleep. So I'm opening up the floor to you to bring forward any kind of questions that you would like for the panels or for the panelists to ask questions if you would like. So you'd like to ask a question? Can I ask, do, do we have a runner for the mic? And then I'll come to you after Anastasia. Here, let's get you the mic. We'll bring it over to you. Why not? I'm, see, look, the, the moderator's off the stage. <laughs> Everyone's worst nightmare. Here we go. Here you go. Hi there. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll get her after. So uh, this, the question is kind of uh, to uh, Matthew and to Niraj. Um, so, um, Can you tell us who you are so that they yes, know? Sorry. sorry. My name's Robin Grosset. I'm the CTO of MindBridge. I'm on the next panel. Okay. You can heckle me if you like. Well, we will. Uh, you back. Self-promotion. We're good with that. Um, so recently, the Canadian government's been talking about algorithmic impact assessments. And I'd like to ask Niraj how he sees the algorithmic... This is a really detailed question. How he sees the algorithmic impact assessments uh, connecting with uh, new energies, um, uh, ethical AI measurements. And, and the question to, to uh, Matthew is, how do you see algorithmic impact assessments working in your space? All right, thank you. So I think you're lucky I go first, Matt Dev. So uh, we have talked about this topic uh, because I'm, I'm delighted to be doing some work with, uh, with Matt and ESTC uh, on the topic of trust measurements for AI. AIA is a Treasury Board Directive, which uh, maybe people don't know, is that the Treasury Board has announced that uh, encouraging the federal government to implement AI, but to do it responsibly and ethically, mm -hmm. and have created a measuring uh, um, directive or research on how to assess the risks of AI. But it's a very broad uh, measure because we have national defense, we have ESDC, we have StatsCan, we have many, many different departments. So it points out that we have to understand the impact, the possible impact of AI uh, before you start figuring out just how much assessment you need to do. So directionally, it's very, very helpful, but we find that we need to get more granular and have a more specific set of measures that vary from department to department. And so we're actually finding that you need to combine the AIA with more specific measures. Um, actually, yeah, I have a very similar answer for you, as, uh, as unfortunate that might be. Um, so the, the directive on automated decision making um, and its, its sister tool, the, the algorithm impact assessment um, that, that TBS developed and, and did so in a very quick fashion and, and, and captures a, a good amount of what I would call responsible AI behavior. Um, TBS was in a weird position where they, as, as Niraj mentioned, they have a number of different departments that they sort of have a governance role associated with, um, and artificial intelligence at ESTC, where we, you know, most of what we do is, is cut checks, really, really to Canadians, um, in terms of the dollars going out anyway, um, is, is a lot different than, say, what Environment Canada would do then. So, so they had to keep it relatively um, applicable to, to all the different departments out there. Um, and the consequence of that is that um, they're not able to go as deep as they probably would have liked in a number of different areas. So uh, my take on it and ESCC's take on it is that we're going to need to continue to develop our own supplementary artificial intelligence policy, which when the directive says something like, you know, you need to test for unintended biases and outcomes, um, we say, well, what does that mean? Um, what does and to what degree does it apply when we're talking about a project that just sort of orders the, uh, just sort of changes the order in which we look at clients' files versus something with a lot more serious in terms of negative impacts, um, like something that will, would deny somebody benefits, right? And NECC isn't mature enough to, to have AIs do that, just in case anybody was writing that down. Um, <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we're building up in a responsible manner. Um, but it means that, no, but when we go, when we go to answer, like when we go to answer some of these questions, we need to have objective measurements. We need to know exactly what it means to measure data set bias and what's an appropriate way to do that and what are everybody else doing. Um, and that's a, a good amount of the direction that, that the work of um, and Niraj and I sort of in our respective organizations have gone towards trying to fill in those gaps and figure out how do we do this. Right? Thank you. Question over here. Hello. Tell us who you are. Yeah. <laughs> my name is Anastasia, and I'm a researcher at Sensor Systems and Internet of Things Lab here at Carleton. Um, so my question is to Niraj. Uh, basically, I'm working on uh, e-health security. 
So we are talking about measuring the trust, and you told that technology is adapting faster than people. So technology is as well adapting much faster than the security for this technology. And how do we trust the technology? Also, very much depends on the security of this technology. So sometimes we can trust, but it's not that secure. And I would like to hear your opinion about measuring security and ways that we can, for example, measure the security um, in general about this topic. Happy to, uh, you know, the uh, quick answer is that we're looking at the differences of AI and, and the trust elements as opposed to some of the, the um, other traditional technology assessments. So we're not necessarily specialists in security or, or performance measures, but recognize that that's important when any application, Matt talked about value of a, an AI algorithm, the value has to be uh, to, to the goals of the, of the algorithm. And if security is one of the main goals, it absolutely has to be measured. We, we're looking at what's different about AI and really at the trust measures uh, that are over and above security. So I may not be the best person to answer that question in, in detail, but I absolutely agree that that's a, an important topic for, for trust in general. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna have a question over here and then we'll have a question over here. But I would also like to encourage us to ask the questions of our scholars as well who are not just working in security and trust. Uh, they are all very important issues, but we have a very interesting group of panelists. I want to make sure that everybody gets some questions, please. Over here. Actually, I'm going to make a, I have a question for Dr. Ashna. Perfect. <laughs> there we go. So I, I'm very impressed <laughs> with the work you're trying to do. Um, but I have a couple of fears being a physicist, so uh, I come from the hard science, and I'd like to ask a few questions about some, some doubts I have about your, your work. <laughs> no, no, no. I think He's okay. You want to go back to me now? He can do it. So my first, uh, and we're talking about um, policy. How do you recognize bad policy from good policy? So one of the issues I have is that you cannot um, find good policy from bad policy looking at the text or the law itself, but you also have to look at what is the goal of the law and possibly ass assign a data set and some tests, right? So if you're writing a policy to reduce unemployment, you have to look after the law is enacted if the unemployment has actually decreased or not. So first issue, you need to define a set a data set that accompanies a law now, are you telling him what to do, or are you asking him a no, question? No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm, kind of, I'm, I'm that kind of moderator. I'm, <laughs> I'm not doing this job. All right, but, okay. okay. So, so ask him a question, please. So question number one. If you do this, the problem is that these sort of tests are not reproducible. If you're looking for policy, uh, economic data is not reproducible. You cannot do experiments. The second question I have, it doesn't seem like there's a much of a market for fact and evidence-based policy right now, but rather uh, <laughs> of policy that is paid for quick electoral gains. So how do you respond to that? All right. Did you tell us who you were? Ah, sorry. I'm Marcello. I work for Elections Canada. Wonder oh, See? <laughs> there we go. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, um, these are excellent questions and challenging ones, of course. Uh, so I, uh, I might have oversold our research project a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but I, uh, you can rest assured that we are not actually trying to tell the government what is a good regulation, what is a bad regulation. Actually, that's one, of, that's one thing that the government would like us probably to tell them. But uh, as a researcher, one of the nice things is that you don't really have to worry about uh, being the one that makes the decision. So what we try to do is... Okay to make very clear that we are measuring certain aspects of law. And whenever you, you talk about policy, at least traditionally, you've, you've used uh, very sort of simple proxies of measuring law. Is there a law? Is it not? Or you've coded maybe for four or five features. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to measure law in a more sophisticated manner so that you can then, for instance, do econometric analysis or you're, you're merely sort of descriptively mapping What's the, uh, what's the uh, uh, prescriptiveness of the stock of Canadian regulation? Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that when a regulation is very prescriptive that it's, it's bad, or if it's not very prescriptive that it's good. That really depends on the policy context. So what we are trying to do is just to, to sort of quantify something that wasn't quantified before and produce more information so that those experts who want to make evidence-based decisions can do that. And of course, 
as a researcher, it's, it's really not up to me to, to tell the government to make good decisions. I would hope that they do, and we can work hard to at least put the information at their disposal, but what they do with it, that's theirs. All right, thank you very much. Please let us know who you are, please. Well, I am uh, Ibrahim, senior data scientist at Laros Technologies and adjunct professor at Carlton. So uh, measuring uh, trust is very, it's very big thing for me to understand, as the trust is a construct, as you mentioned, changing with time and all that stuff. And measuring, I mean, if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it, you cannot assess it, and I agree. So my question is, don't, don't you think that we should have a ground truth for the trust? For, the, for example, domain knowledge or data set. We should have a, a ground truth of, on things that they are trusted with a score 0.9, trusted with score 0.5. Then we can, okay, argument, uh, have an argument about the uh, quantification of trust. Again, it's the same in the law or maybe in any other field, like having a ground truth that domain experts agree on before like measuring it. Thank you. Sandra, do you want to comment on that too? Or, um, go ahead. No. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I just barely mentioned uh, that we, we really would like to create an ecosystem around this topic of AI trust. And uh, I also would get on my soapbox and say that when you look globally, I think Canada has an opportunity to lead in this area of trustworthy AI. So any one company or entrepreneur isn't going to make the difference. It's really the ecosystem. So research is a big opportunity and having common data on trust, I think is what you're getting at. And so, so a data point right now doesn't mean much unless you have some ways to compare it and measure it against other benchmarks. So we would like to create a, an ecosystem of shared data and ha common language so that we can create those, those more effective, meaningful measures, I think is what you're getting at, than just a, a number. Um, numbers help, but the trend and the comparison is really helpful. So before going to this question, we, Matthew, would you have a response to this question or perhaps Sandra as well? Um, the only thing I might add is that I think, I think the goal, like I think these issues are being discussed at all circles um, of the globe right now. Like, like I, think, I think the discourse is there. Um, I think the goal right now should be how do we turn subjective into objective, right? Evidence-based. What, what we need to come to a consensus on um, when we go to measure, like, uh, algorithm interpretability is a really important, there was some really important work going on this morning that I, I thought was really cool. Um, we need the science to come through on that, right? Like, we need the mathematicians, computer scientists, and, and others around the room to, to say, okay, I'm going to turn the subjective notion that society is facing into an objective measurement that then we have more embedded trust in. Um, and I think that evidence and that fact will, should drive where we're headed with, with AI for public good is the only thing I would add, really. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm only concerned around the, um, uh, the efficacy of the data that is produced is important, but for those kinds of questions around trust, it's also there's a, we need a framework, right? Before we rush to get into uh, the details, I think a framework needs to underwrite how how we broadly address this issue at a societal level and then each unique organization or development facility, shared partnerships between government and, and the university that are developing so solutions and want to, want to go through and struggle with these issues around trust, start from the ground up and, and bake in these, this sort of perspective around ethics and trust into the work that's being done. Like these can't work in a sort of uh, reactive way in which we put a band-aid over the solution at the end, right? So um, having having good data is, is hugely important, but it's not more important than having a good framework that comes from a thoughtful, reflective process. And it is going on, and I think you mentioned before, I think a lot of the leadership is coming out of Europe at the moment. Some of the thinking that was provoked by the GDPR, the new privacy data regulations. So there's that I think there's, um, there is momentum, uh, as you say. I think a lot is going on, but I think it really requires a certain sort of marriage between different kinds of thinking to make a, a robust platform. Thank you. We have a question over here, and then we'll go over here. Then we have one here, and your number <laughs> over there. Whoa! All right, sure so <laughs> you guys will help me out, all right? So I'll be as honest as I can. All right, please. Thank you. I'm uh, Tejinder, I'm from the city of Ottawa in the service transformation team. I'm working on digital initiatives, 
My question is regarding accessibility. So when we work on digital initiatives, we look at the various channels. So for web, for example, we have guidelines, AODA, WCAG 2.0. What we're struggling with is on the voice portion, what kind of things should we keep in mind? What are the best practices? How do we make it so that it is accessible? Sandra, can you help us a little is bit? That, uh, if I heard you, is that like for, um, I, pardon me, I couldn't. Can you speak sorry. a little bit louder, please? Sh you, certainly. Here we go. There we're talking about okay. it. Yeah. So I was looking for guidelines on uh, working with uh, Siri, Google, and, and what kind of things should we keep in mind? What back best practices should we look at to make it accessible? Similar to how when we look at websites or applications and we have guidelines at AODA and WCAG and 2.0, things like that that help us make things more accessible. Um, well, I think if you're talking in particularly about uh, voice recognition and if you're talking about third party systems like Siri. Um, it's, it's difficult because um, closer so she gets there's no, uh, there's no, um, you're, you don't own the standards that drive how Siri is constructed. So that, that's your first problem in my view. When you, when, if you're working with uh, data, uh, databases or uh, websites that the city has some ownership and control over producing and managing, you can set up particular kinds of accessibility guidelines. I think when you turn to voice recognition that's third party system, you lose that control. Um, um, and also that people are very sensitive in some instances of using, um, of using any of those third party corporate systems like Siri and those produced by Google or Amazon. So there's a comfort level there to me that kind of intercedes in figuring out a, a solution that you can customize. So I mean that's sort of my perspective on it and you've actually worked in, um, maybe there's a, a solution you've thought of or a way of approaching that. Yeah, no, I think it's a great answer, Sandra. I would just add that uh, the, the two topics I briefly mentioned, bias and privacy, uh, are clearly issues in voice recognition. And so one of the questions you can ask of, of even the big corporates is what languages do you support and is that good enough for your target population? So maybe four languages is all you need but if you have a, a diverse population of 100 languages, you better know that there's a bias there. That doesn't mean you don't do it, because people are biased, machines are biased, but you should know. And, and privacy is another one, is that where's your data going? And uh, what are the purposes used for that data? Those are questions I think you can even ask the big corporates, and you can say no to them. Crazy thoughts, <laughs> all right? <laughs> We have a question from this gentleman here, and then I have one over here, and then I'll come to you, and then you, and then you. And then we might have to cut it off there, and if I get the order wrong, let me know. I'm sure you will. Thank you. Hi, um, Daniel Bies. I manage a data science unit for Health Canada's Health Product and Food Branch. And uh, when you're talking about trust in AI, uh, you're talking about harms that result from the misuse of information and algorithms. And right now, the primary regulatory framework that we have in both government and private industry that speaks to and controls harms as a result of the misuse of information is around privacy. And so my question for the panel and anybody else who wants to express an opinion is, firstly, in your opinion, is are the harms that result in a privacy breach and anything that comes downstream of a privacy breach the most significant harm to individuals in society as a result of, of, of misuse of information. So does privacy cover it all? And secondly, if it doesn't, what are some other ways that we could think about in terms of governing what people do with information, recognizing that the vast majority of Canada's information is not in fact in public hands and is not in fact governed by anything other than privacy? Can we start with you, Wolfgang, the easy question? Sorry, <laughs> yep. moderator's prerogative. <laughs> I, I think it's a, it's a great question and uh, my colleague at the University of Ottawa, Teresa Scasa, would be probably better at, uh, than me at answering this. But, but I think in, in general, of course, there are multiple harms that can come from the, the misuse of AI. And part of the challenge today is to, to map that and to then identify what kind of legal framework can really respond to that. Because if we think about where privacy comes from, it doesn't... It wasn't made for, for the AI context. So uh, I think that's what this process is now about to, to think about tomorrow's no. regulatory framework. You all there. You're going to have to live with my order. Thank you. Over here um, I can, and then over here. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I was Thank just going to add. Um, so I think 
how shall I put this? Um, so I think you're right. I think the closest, pro the closest to constitutional protection we have is, is the Privacy Act um, in terms of this kind of stuff. But um, privacy also conflicts with a number of other Say and and I know I know privacy by design is, is sort of saying well it's no it's not conflict but but ultimately at the end of the day um, you know we we're, we're in situations where we want to be able to measure and test for bias in these systems but aren't necessarily allowed to collect and or link and or use that information for that purpose uh, because you know we're subject to laws that make us keep the minimum data of what we have right we're subject to um, uh, you know, not keeping any ex ex extraneous information or, or certain linkage restrictions that, that, that the government has. Um, but from a, so I, I agree that privacy is, is absolutely critical, um, but I think the work that's, that's undergoing, un, under being undertaken right now to sort of revisit the Privacy Act, I'm hoping is sort of cognizant of the fact that in this, in this digital economy, the concept of privacy has drastically changed. Um, in, and we're in, in, in scenarios where, um, for example, if, if, if the federal government were to offer a chatbot through Facebook, Facebook Messenger or something like that, right? Perfect example where, you know, we know that Facebook's a very widely used tool. We want people to, say, talk to the service. Um, the Privacy Act almost acts as a little bit of a deterrent and, and data management as well um, to public servants trying to keep that information, right? Like about the, in, the interaction between us and the client, saying, well, we don't really want to keep it. You know, privacy is important. But we have to be cognizant of the fact that Facebook is keeping every little detail that happened in that conversation and probably selling it, you know, and I don't know if anybody from Facebook's here is mean to single, single them out or whatever. But, um, like, the point is, is that, like, privacy laws need to be really respective of the, the environment that we're working in. Um, but, to, yes, absolutely correct. Well, I would just add, please do not contract with Facebook. <laughs> um, I, Hypothetical you're not, scenario. You're not but. suggesting that, but I, 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 think, I think privacy application is crucial, but we need to be uh, clear that um, uh, it's, really, it's really all about controlling the data and securing the data, and I think, um, I don't think we want to lose sight of that, even as we change some of, the, some of the laws that have already come in, some of the bills recently that have maybe softened the walls uh, in between data sharing in some respects, but I think it is an important consideration and that there are risks when we think downstream to how correlations are made between unrelated bits and pieces that are out there and what happens to those kinds of decisions that roll out of those systems and even if they're unanticipated. And that, that we have to have, I think, as citizens, we need guarantees that that information will be um, uh, contained within uh, the sort of government apparatus and not shared, you know, without some due consideration. So I'd just add that uh, piece. Thank you. So just so you know that I'm not super mean, I'm a little bit mean, I have five minutes. We have a question here, we have a question there, we have a question here, and we had a question here, and that's going to be it. I apologize. <laughs> but I did negotiate for us to have a bar here later, <laughs> right? So that Save we can go and have those talks after, one-on-one. -on -one. So without further ado, we have a, pardon me, unfortunately a paid bar. <laughs> We've had to change the policy at the institution. That's another story. We can discuss that at the bar, too. All right, so please, over here. Uh, Spence Percy, recent graduate, looking to become a data scientist. Uh, this is kind of just a sweeping question. I feel that data as a product is very unique in its respect that it's not necessarily generated by the company, but generated by the user. So this is kind of just a sweeping question as to how can companies claim ownership and sell this data that is, at the end of the day, being generated by people, like just the individual? Like, in respect of a product, there's nothing else like that. So it's kind of a gray area for it. Well, I, I think the answer is um, capitalism. And, um, I'm not saying that, I mean... More know. of it? Yeah. What do you mean? What are you saying? It's the Lockean argument, right? Uh, that the companies would probably argue that they uh, put a certain amount of labor into processing that data and then that's where they make an ownership claim. I'm not saying I agree with that, but that's really part of the argument. It's very fundamental to that, um, uh, to that sort of argument that uh, we, and, and if it's the case of a Facebook or Twitter, we give you this free service and uh, you handily categorize all human communication with a hashtag. Thank you for that. 
and we'll organize it and it's we're going to sell access to it because we did do all this other stuff to it and so it's now it's basically ours right so i think that to me that's part of that what's happening there right is that they're making that case but i suppose I agree. Work is you've, I agree. You've, you've, you've asked one of the most fundamental yes. questions yeah. of our time. Yeah. I yes. Would say, right? <laughs> yes. No, but, but so that's good. why we have a bar, but asked. it is a fundamental it's question. Good. Yeah. No, but yeah. like in, in, in the, the digital economy we have, this, this issue of whether data is a public good or a personal good or a private good, I think needs to go up to the the public discourse level, right? Like, yeah. and I think Europe is further ahead. I think they've come out with at least partial stance with the GDPR. Um, Canada hasn't. And we should have this discussion. And this should be, you know, on Adam Solomon or whatever political show that everybody listens to here. Um, like, these, these are very important issues that yeah. this panel isn't going to be able to solve. Right? So life cycle management and governance of the full life cycle and then ownership. Yeah. And we have a bunch of legal, legal scholars and colleagues here that can maybe help us discuss that too. Thank you very much for your question. Yes. Hello, uh, my name is Emir Katara. I work in... Uh, I analytics BI. I work at Carleton University. Um, I've been working with AI for the last twelve. You years. You have to get to the question quick. Sure. Uh, so, <laughs> so one aspect is is uh, how are AI using our data? Uh, is it good? Is it for you know transparency, etc.? But another way is, and it's very uh, relevant to the uh, economic sphere. Here, uh, who's using our algorithms? Who's using our whatever we we, we author? Uh, what is the application for it? We don't have that transparency yet. Um, I I think it's it's uh, one of the uh, issues with AI is um, hyper militarization. Question. So, so the question is. Thank you. Can we have uh, certain uh, policies to protect f for the? Uh, Owners or the the authors uh, of of uh, AI algorithms to protect the uh, uh, the application of the algorithm, and make sure that it's actually ethical. Uh, can we do that? Europe have, has done that, uh, so can we do that? All right, perfect. Excuse my meanness, but we have a couple of other people. Absolutely. So I leave it to. Uh, go to it's all yours again. <laughs> you get all the good ones. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Sorry for. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I really, I don't have much much to say about this. The, I think the uh, what we've discussed before is that one of the advantages is having algorithms out in the public domain that makes it accessible for everybody, and the misuse that can come from that is just a byproduct of all the good that comes to it. And so tracking, tracking that type of use or even regulating that use might then limit the, uh, the propagation of the good work that could come from algorithms. So uh, there's a balance to be struck, but I'm not here to, to strike that balance. Maybe I'll add a quick comment here. Uh, you know, as a private sector person in, in this entrepreneurial area of AI, it's obviously moving very quickly, and the legal system and policies are, by definition, going to lag. And, and so we definitely want to encourage that discussion, and, you know, it's a, it's a global challenge about having, because data is not a Canadian decision, it's a, it's a, so it, it's got to be pushed, but I don't think we should wait. I think governance of AI has to be looked at by the user, the implementer, and you know we shouldn't wait for policies and the legal frameworks to catch up. We need to do the right thing and be explicit about it and transparent about it. Thank you. Uh, because of time, you're going to give me the hairy eyeball. I know it. All right. Thank goodness. But I couldn't take the hairy eyeball from Wendy. So Wendy, you have the last question, please. OK, you'll find out how long I've been waiting to ask this question, because I'm going right back to the guarantee of trust. <laughs> right. And that was at the beginning of this uh, wonderful session. And my, my question is there, how do you guarantee trust and still guarantee civil rights oh. or human rights? That may be one for the bar. <laughs> yeah, it might be one for the bar, but does anybody want to take a little teaser at that one? I mean, you're coming up with the trust index. You're having to deal with it and to govern it. Um, the, one, the one thing I would, I would comment on that, and that's a very, a very bar question, um, is that the, um, the high-level AI ethics group, 
coming out of Europe, which has I have a panel of 50, 50 experts from different domains and a lot of the big players in the industry, et cetera, et cetera, um, had human rights as sort of one of the fundamental pillars um, of that ethical framework, right? So I think um, I, I, without getting in the discussion about how trust might conflict with human rights, I think, I think I'd frame the answer as trust should be driven from human rights and, and principles and, and values should come from those exact things um, and then hopefully everything flows downstream. Um, I think that's the objective. It'll, you know, we'll see how well that gets realized as we move into the, as we move into the future. I would just say that, you know, you can't guarantee it. Um, you you want to set the bar as high as possible and, and measure it and be cognizant of, of w when we're off a kilter, but uh, you know, we don't have a perfect world, and uh, but we should keep trying. <laughs> Sandra and Wolfgang, any final well, closing just, words? Uh, I mean, human rights, this is about human dignity, and mm -hmm. I think that's where we need to, um, I think it is possible to bring these together because I agree, you want to come out of a sort of aspect of humanity, and so that when you think about these systems that are governing human beings and, and have the decision-making power over human beings in, when they're in that context, then absolutely we have to be able to say that that system is trustworthy to ensure that we are treated um, with every uh, possible generous sort of uh, aspect of human dignity. We deserve that. So great question. Thank you. Well, the only thing that maybe in closing I would add is that the flip side, of course, is also there that uh, AI can facilitate human rights can, can help access to, to justice, as I, as I mentioned during my talk. And so it, it sort of cuts, cuts both ways. And sometimes we frame AI in a more negative light than it perhaps deserves to be right. framed. You've made my job easy because I didn't have to ask any questions. <laughs> so thank you for that. And since I was up early and didn't get to run around, you also made me run, which is even better. So thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, before we thank our panelists, I have just a, a little announcement for you before we go in, and before we go and take a break. Uh, the Government of Canada is the lead of the Open Government Partnership uh, at the moment. And we have the good fart fortune that this year, the Global Summit, that will be bringing 750 delegates from around the world to Ottawa, will be here on May 29 and 31. To 29 to 31, it's open. They are seeking input from the private sector because right now they have very little input from the private sector. And we need to keep in mind that their key objectives is governments around the world are looking to harness new technologies to strengthen governance and to promote innovation. And they need your help for that. Uh, in the audience, do we have Matt Cullen? Matt over there is the person from the OGP. If you want to go talk with him about these opportunities, the event is free. Uh, because there are presidents and high-ranking delegates coming, there is some security clearance that's required, but it is a free and open event and an important one, and they really need the help of the private sector. So please go and talk with Matt at the back. And without further ado, I'd like to thank this amazing panel for answering your questions and eliciting some fantastic questions and providing, sharing with us their knowledge and their thoughts and their experience. Thank you. Thank you.